Shakyamuni. Shakyamuni. As I think you all know, he began with the path of asceticism, undergoing tortures and austerities which others before him had never attempted, including prolonged fasting. But he failed to attain enlightenment by these means and, half dead from hunger and exhaustion, came to realize the futility of pursuing a course which could only terminate in death. So he drank the milk rice that was offered him by a concerned country girl, gradually regained his health, and resolved to steer a middle course between self-torture and self-indulgence. Thereafter he devoted himself exclusively to Zazen for six years and eventually. On the morning of the 8th of December, at the very instant when he glanced at the planet Venus gleaming in the eastern sky, he attained perfect enlightenment. All this we believe as historical truth. The words the Buddha uttered involuntarily at this time are recorded variously in the Buddhist scriptures. According to the Kagon Sutra, at the moment of enlightenment he spontaneously cried out, Wonder of wonders! Intrinsically all living beings are Buddhas, endowed with wisdom and virtue, but because people's minds have become inverted through delusive thinking they fail to perceive this. The first pronouncement of the Buddha seems to have been one of awe and astonishment. Yes, how truly marvelous that all human beings, whether clever or stupid, male or female, ugly or beautiful, are whole and complete just as they are. That is to say, the nature of every being is inherently without a flaw, perfect, no different from that of Amida or any other Buddha. This first declaration of Shakyamuni Buddha is also the ultimate conclusion of Buddhism. Yet human beings, restless and anxious, live half-crazed existences because their minds, heavily encrusted with delusion, are turned topsy-turvy. We need therefore to return to our original perfection, to see through the false image of ourselves as incomplete and sinful, and to wake up to our inherent purity and wholeness. The most effective means by which to accomplish this is through Zazen. Not only Shakyamuni Buddha himself but many of his disciples attained full awakening through Zazen. Moreover, during the Years since the Buddha's death innumerable devotees in India, China, and Japan have, by grasping this selfsame key, resolved for themselves the most fundamental question of all. What is the meaning of life and death? Even in this day there are many who, having cast off worry and anxiety, have emancipated themselves through Zazen. Between a supremely perfected Buddha and us, who are ordinary, there is no difference as to substance. This, substance, can be likened to water. One of the salient characteristics of water is its conformability. When put into a round vessel it becomes round, when put into a square vessel it becomes square. We have this same adaptability, but as we live bound and fettered through ignorance of our true nature, we have forfeited this freedom. To pursue the metaphor, we can say that the mind of a Buddha is like water that is calm, deep and crystal clear, and upon which the moon of truth reflects fully and perfectly. The mind of the ordinary person, on the other hand, is like murky water, constantly being churned by the gales of delusive thought and no longer able to reflect the moon of truth. The moon nonetheless shines steadily upon the waves, but as the waters are roiled we are unable to see its reflection. Thus we lead lives that are frustrating and meaningless. How can we fully illumine our life and personality with the moon of truth? We need first to purify this water, to calm the surging waves by halting the winds of discursive thought. In other words, we must empty our minds of what the Kagon Sutra calls the conceptual thought of the human being. Most people place a high value on abstract thought, but Buddhism has clearly demonstrated that discriminative thinking lies at the root of delusion. 
I once heard someone say, Thought is the sickness of the human mind. From the Buddhist point of view this is quite true. To be sure, abstract thinking is useful when wisely employed. Which is to say, when its nature and limitations are properly understood. But as long as human beings remain slaves to their intellect, fettered and controlled by it, they can well be called sick. All thoughts, whether ennobling or debasing, are mutable and impermanent. They have a beginning and an end even as they are fleetingly with us, and this is as true of the thought of an era as of an individual. In Buddhism thought is referred to as the stream of life and death. It is important in this connection to distinguish the role of transitory thoughts from that of fixed concepts. Random ideas are relatively innocuous. But ideologies, beliefs, opinions, and points of view, not to mention the factual knowledge accumulated since birth, are the shadows which obscure the light of truth. So long as the winds of thought continue to disturb the water of our self-nature, we cannot distinguish truth from untruth. It is imperative, therefore, that these winds be stilled. Once they abate, the waves subside, the muddiness clears, and we perceive directly that the moon of truth has never ceased shining. The moment of such realization is Kensho, I. E. Enlightenment, the apprehension of the true substance of our self-nature. Unlike moral and philosophical concepts, which are variable, true insight is imperishable. Now for the first time we can live with inner peace and dignity, free from perplexity and disquiet, and in harmony with our environment. I have spoken to you briefly about these matters, but I hope I have succeeded in conveying to you the importance of Zazen. Let us now talk about practice. The first step is to select a quiet room in which to sit. Lay out a fairly soft mat or pad some three feet square. And on top of this place a small circular cushion measuring about one foot in diameter to sit on, or use a square cushion folded in two or even a folded or rolled up blanket. Preferably one should not wear trousers or socks, since these interfere with the crossing of the legs and the placing of the feet. For a number of reasons it is best to sit in the full lotus posture. To sit full lotus you place the foot of the right leg over the thigh of the left and the foot of the left leg over the thigh of the right. The main point of this particular method of sitting is that by establishing a wide, solid base with the crossed legs and both knees touching the mat, you achieve repose and absolute stability. When the body is immobile, Thoughts are not stirred into activity by physical movements and the mind is more easily quieted. If you have difficulty sitting in the full lotus posture because of the pain, sit half lotus, which is done by putting the foot of the left leg over the thigh of the right and the right leg under the left thigh. For those of you who are not accustomed to sitting cross-legged, even this position may not be easy to maintain. You will probably find it difficult to keep the two knees resting on the mat and will have to push one or both of them down again and again until they remain there. In both the half and the full lotus postures the uppermost foot can be reversed when the legs become tired. For those who find both of these traditional zazen positions acutely uncomfortable, an alternative position is the traditional Japanese one of sitting on the heels and calves. This can be maintained for a longer time if a cushion is placed between the heels and the buttocks. One advantage of this posture is that the back can be kept erect easily. However, should all of these positions prove too painful, you may use a chair. Next rest the right hand in the lap palm upward, and place the left hand, palm upward, on top of the right palm. 
Lightly touch the tips of the thumbs to each other so that a flattened circle is formed by the palms and thumbs. The right side of the body is the active side, the left the passive. Accordingly, during practice we quiet the active side by placing the left foot and left hand over the right members, as an aid in achieving the highest degree of tranquility. If you look at a figure of the Buddha, however, you will notice that the position of these members is just the reverse. The significance of this is that a Buddha, unlike the rest of us, is actively engaged in the task of liberation. After you have crossed your legs, bend forward so as to thrust the buttocks out, then slowly bring the trunk to an erect posture. The head should be straight. If looked at from the side, your ears should be in line with your shoulders and the tip of your nose in line with your navel. The body from the waist up should be weightless, free from pressure or strain. Keep the eyes open and the mouth closed. The tip of the tongue should lightly touch the back of the upper teeth. If you close your eyes you will fall into a dull and dreamy state. The gaze should be lowered without focusing on anything in particular, but be careful not to incline the head forward. Experience has shown that the mind is quietest, with the least fatigue or strain, when the eyes are in this lowered position. The spinal column must be erect at all times. This admonition is important. When the body slumps, not only is undue pressure placed on the internal organs, interfering with their free functioning, but the vertebrae by impinging upon nerves may cause strains of one kind or another. Since body and mind are one, any impairment of the physiological functions inevitably involves the mind and thus diminishes its clarity and one-pointedness, which are essential for effective concentration. From a purely psychological point of view, a ramrod erectness is as undesirable as a slouching position, for the one springs from unconscious pride and the other from abjectness, and since both are grounded in ego they are equally a hindrance to enlightenment. Be careful to hold the head erect. If it inclines forward or backward or sideward, remaining there for an appreciable length of time, a crick in the neck may result. When you have established a correct posture, take a deep breath, hold it momentarily, then exhale slowly and quietly. Repeat this two or three times, always breathing through the nose. After that breathe naturally. When you have accustomed yourself to this routine, one deep breath at the beginning will suffice. After that, breathe naturally without trying to manipulate your breath. Now bend the body first to the right as far as it will go. Then to the left, about seven or eight times, in large arcs to begin with, then smaller ones until the trunk naturally comes to rest at center. You are now ready to concentrate your mind. There are many good methods of concentration bequeathed to us by our predecessors in Zen. The easiest for beginners is counting incoming and outgoing breaths. The value of this particular exercise lies in the fact that all reasoning is excluded and the discriminative mind put at rest. Thus the waves of thought are stilled and a gradual one-pointedness of mind achieved. To start with, count both inhalations and exhalations. When you inhale concentrate on, one. When you exhale, on, two, and so on, up to ten. Then you return to, one, and once more count up to ten, continuing as before. If you lose the count, return to, one. It is as simple as that. As I have previously pointed out, fleeting thoughts which naturally fluctuate in the mind are not in themselves an impediment. This unfortunately is not commonly recognized. Even among Japanese who have been practicing Zen for five years or more there are many who misunderstand Zen practice to be a stopping of consciousness. 
There is indeed a kind of zazen that aims at doing just this. But it is not the traditional zazen of Zen Buddhism. You must realize that no matter how intently you count your breaths you will still perceive what is in your line of vision. Since your eyes are open, and you will hear the normal sounds about you, as your ears are not plugged. And since your brain likewise is not asleep, various thought forms will dart about in your mind. Now, they will not hamper or diminish the effectiveness of zazen unless, evaluating them as good, you cling to them or, deciding they're bad, you try to check or eliminate them. You must not regard any perceptions or sensations as an obstruction to zazen, nor should you pursue any of them. I emphasize this. Pursuit, simply means that in the act of seeing, your gaze lingers on objects. In the course of hearing, your attention dwells on sounds. And in the process of thinking, your mind adheres to ideas. If you allow yourself to be distracted in such ways, your concentration on the counting of your breaths will be impeded. To recapitulate. Let random thoughts arise and vanish as they will. Do not dally with them and do not try to expel them, but merely concentrate all your energy on counting the inhalations and exhalations of your breath. In terminating a period of sitting do not arise abruptly, but begin by rocking from side to side, first in small swings, then in large ones, for about half a dozen times. You will observe that your movements in this exercise are the reverse of those you engage in when you begin zazen. Rise slowly and quietly walk around with the others in what is called kinhan, a walking form of zazen. Kinhan is performed by placing the right fist, with thumb inside, on the chest and covering it with the left palm while holding both elbows at right angles. Keep the arms in a straight line and the body erect, with the eyes resting upon a point about two yards in front of the feet. At the same time continue to count inhalations and exhalations as you walk slowly around the room. Begin walking with the left foot and walk in such a way that the foot sinks into the floor, first the heel and then the toes. Walk calmly and steadily, with poise and dignity. The walking must not be done absent-mindedly, and the mind must be taught as you concentrate on the counting. It is advisable to practice walking this way for at least 5 minutes after each sitting period of 20 to 30 minutes. You are to think of this walking as zazen in motion. Rinzai and Soto differ considerably in their way of doing kinhan. In Rinzai the walking is brisk and energetic while in traditional soto it is slow and leisurely. In fact, upon each breath you step forward only six inches or so. My own teacher, Harada Roshi, advocated a gait somewhere between these two and that is the method we have been practicing here. Further, the Rinzai sect cuts the left hand on top of the right, whereas in the orthodox soto the right hand is placed on top. Harada Roshi felt that the Rinzai method of putting the left hand uppermost was more desirable and so he adopted it into his own teaching. Now, even though this walking relieves the stiffness in your legs, such relief is to be regarded as a mere byproduct and not the main object of Kinhan. Accordingly, those of you who are counting your breaths should continue during Kinhan and those of you who are working on a koan should carry on with it. This ends the first lecture. Continue to count your breaths as I have instructed until you come before me again. 2. Precautions to observe in Zazen. In this second lecture I am going to change your breathing exercise slightly. This morning I told you to count, 1, as you inhaled and, 2, as.